Okay, I believe we are ready to start. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Of course, you had freedom from choice. You had this or nothing. So, <laughs> uh, all right. So I put in my uh, my uh, suggestion on things to talk about or to talk about, and I said, well, you know, I just did this new G Union thing, and uh, so I'll just talk about that. And then after they accepted the talk, and I started writing it, I realized that. It only takes about 10 minutes to describe what G Union does, and I had a little more time than that. Uh, so I figure most of you have probably not spent much of your life, you know, sort of figuring out where the GOM layer is in the FreeBSD kernel or what it is exactly that it does. So I'm going to give you a little tutorial about sort of how the how the kernel is laid out and where this particular thing lives. And then at the very end of my talk, I will actually talk about G Union itself. So I teach a have taught for many years a class about the FreeBSD kernel. And one of the early assignments I gave to my students was uh, on a single piece of paper, I want you to draw the entire uh, unit or FreeBSD kernel. And uh, so one of them did this. Uh, what they did, however, was they put it, printed it on fan folded paper that was about <laughs> 20 feet long. <laughs> Uh, but over time, it's gotten condensed down. And so now this is the entire kernel all on one slide. And uh, at the bottom down here, we have the hardware. And at the top, we have the system call interface to the kernel. And I was actually giving this talk to some folks at Intel. And they said, we always wondered what all that software goo was that made our hardware look like it was running so slowly. Uh, but I like to think that at least all that goo, as they called it, uh, is actually providing us with some uh, useful functionality. So most of the access that you have is through a file descriptor. I mean, we, you know, we have the stuff to go in and get the file descriptor in the first place. Uh, but once you have a file descriptor, then uh, it comes in to the system here and uh, goes you know, down into the various bits and pieces. So the part we know the best is the descriptor uh, references a V node, and then the V node is either going to deal with special devices like TTYs or raw devices or raw disks, uh, but it can also give you a handle into the VM system. Uh, over on the far side there, it can come into the socket, which can go through network protocols and all that sort of thing. Uh, or then we can also come into the... Uh, uh, to NFS or the fast file system. Uh, the one exception we have is ZFS, which uh, it was sort of a, a project that was done separately from Solaris, and they just they didn't want to have to deal with all the other groups at Solaris. So ZFS just lives in its own little world here. The this, this scripture just goes straight down into the IO subsystem, and it bypasses things like the page cache and the VM system and all that. Uh, it means that it's very self-contained, and that's kind of nice, but it also means that, for example, if you want to mmap a file in ZFS, we end up having to uh, essentially go over to the VM system, get the page, copy it over here, uh, and then anytime something happens, we have to copy that data back over into the buffer cache. So that's what makes it inefficient to use if you're mapping uh, files into memory uh, or if you're trying to use things like send file. Uh, because we end up with all those extra copying from the memory it's using over into the page cache and vice versa. All right, well, we have all of these various things, you know, direct access to disks or through file systems or the VM system, but eventually they need to get some IO done, even ZFS. And so what we have that the really, what we'll think of as the IO layer is this stuff down at the bottom here. And uh, in the old days, you just went straight into a device driver, and the device drivers became almost like little operating systems of their own. I remember at one point, I was looking at one of the device drivers for a disk, and it was 35,000 lines of code. Uh, just to give the, uh, context here, the original Unix was 10,000 lines of code, the entire operating system. Uh, so, it, you know, it was just dealing with a whole lot of different things. And uh, when you needed to adapt to a new disk, you just grabbed this 35,000 lines of code and then started trying to find the places in it that you had to change stuff. Uh, so that was just an unmitigated disaster. So what ended up happening was that 
uh, Paul Henning Camp actually uh, started out by saying, look, we got to sort of get this stuff divided up and put into discrete pieces. And so the first uh, piece that I'll look here is this thing called new bus, which should really be called old bus or ancient bus at this point. But uh, <laughs> the idea was that you have these uh, various uh, disks or whatever type of other things, uh, hardware, and it, need, or it needs to get out to the IO subsystem. Well, the, the thing is that you can have a disk and it might plug in as a USB disk or it might plug in as a PCI disk or, I mean, some disks you can plug them in in multiple ways. You know, they have different connectors on the back. And these, you don't want to have to have your disk device driver know how to deal with all that stuff. So what we have here is kind of a generic layer and then Nubus knows how to route the output that's coming out of that out to wherever the actual hardware uh, lives that you're talking to. And then the other thing was that there's sort of two parts to disk drivers. There's the stuff that's sort of, we'll call it common across disk drivers. Uh, so it's things like tag queuing so that you can uh, you know, put a tag on something. And so you may send a bunch of things out and they may get completed in a different order than you sent them out. And so with the tag, when it comes back, you can say, oh, that was this particular request. So it sort of lets you attach those things together. There's all kinds of different bad block forwarding that has to be dealt with. And there's no particular reason that every single disk device driver needs to have that. So what we end up doing is having this cam layer and this keeps all of that kind of bad block handling and tag queuing and all that sort of stuff, which is sort of generic across all disk drives. And then down at the bottom here, we just take this sort of generic description of an IO and turn it into a SCSI command or an ATA command. And of course, the, the ATA, the person that was dealing with ATA disks was different than the person that was dealing with SCSI disks, and they didn't really talk to each other. So we had these distinct sets of drivers for the two. Uh, these days, ATA is pretty much gone, and we just uh, run everything through the, the so-called CAM devices. All right, well, the other sorts of things that we used to do with disks was things like we were mirroring disks, or we were rating disks, or you know, lot, lots of different ways that you can sort of deal with disks. And again, that nonsense all used to be in the disk device driver. And that was like craziness. So the other part that sort of got abstracted out is the geom layer. And the geom layer is what we think of as disk management, if you will. Uh, so this is the, the geom layer are little modules that you can plug in to perform different functions. So there's a a mirror that you can plug in or a RAID that you can plug in. Uh, and in fact, if you go look in the geom directory, there's a lot of different things that you can plug in these days. And so now what's gonna happen is that things that are up at the file system level or <clears throat> the raw disk level, when they, when they talk to something, what they see is sort of what geom has constructed for them. So the, the file system is mirrored that mirroring is actually happening for it in the geom layer here. Um, not for ZFS, of course, that has to do its own thing, but um, you, you could pass a mirrored set of disks to, to ZFS if you wanted to. Uh, generally, you don't put much stuff in the geom layer for ZFS. Okay, so the place that I wanna focus today is in this geom layer itself. So this is where I'm getting direct accesses from my clients up above and I am feeding ultimately down into something that's gonna deal with the storage. So Geom is not dealing with any of the storage issues for the most part. It's just dealing with how those underlying storage units are put together. Okay. So let's start with sort of the, the classic simple example of uh, a Geom module. And that would be something that we'll do uh, disk partitioning. So what ends up happening is that a disk comes into existence. Uh, and so you know, we, we, a disk gets plugged in or we're probing as we're starting up the system and we find this first disk and it is gonna be disk DA0. And so what'll happen is that uh, the, the probing code will have found it. It will have discovered that, you know, it says here's disk DA0. 
and magically in the dev directory slash dev slash DA0 will show up. And anytime something new shows up, uh, GOM is notified about it. Now, it could be that what just showed up was a, a, a serial line. And GOM will go, well, I have no interest in that and nothing will happen. But when something shows up that is a disk, then G, the, uh, the GOM layer says, ah, now that's interesting to me. And it'll do what's described as tasting. So it'll sort of go, doop, 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 read the first little bit off the disk to see if there's anything there that's of interest to it. And in this particular example, it finds a GPT label. And it says, ah, there's a GPT label here. And so then, uh, and this GPT label has uh, two slices on it. Uh, and so it will create DA0 slice one, DA0 slice two, and boom, boom, those two names will now suddenly appear in slash dev. Well, these both look like disks too. So GM will go, oh, two new disks just showed up. So taste, taste, taste the way it goes. And sure enough, at the beginning of slice one, it finds something that it discovers to be a BSD label. And uh, so reads the BSD label and says, oh, look, there's you know eight partitions here, A through H, and boop, 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 boop. All these partitions will now show up in flash dev. And gee, they look like disks. And so it'll taste them, but doesn't find anything of interest to GOM. And so now we're done. When I actually did this example, I wanted, I, you know, who uses BSD labels these days? I wanted to have, you know, like another set of GPT labels. And it came back IO error when I did that. And uh, it was only when I asked Warner today, I said, so why can't I have a GPT label at the beginning of this? And he goes, oh, because GPT in the specifications says you can't do that. But there's a sys control that you can set and uh, <laughs> don't enforce that rule. And then you could have multiple levels of GPT labels. Right. So that's why you come to conferences like that, because people can actually fill in those sorts of questions for you. OK, everyone's good so far? Not lost? OK. So now let's suppose that we want to mirror, uh, have mirroring in our file system. Well, again, it's not something that the file system is gonna deal with. That's something that we're gonna deal with at the GOM layer. So sort of continuing from the previous slide, uh, we had DA0 and we had a GPT label on it that had a couple slices. Uh, and then uh, the other, we also have a second disk because if you're gonna mirror, it's sort of silly to like to mirror on two different slices of the same disk. Uh, and this one also has a GPT label. Uh, and so what we're gonna end up doing is uh, the mirror is gonna be constructed from DA one slice one and DA zero slice one. Mm -hmm. And these will, the beginning of these partitions will also have labeling that will also be tasted by GOM and it will discover, uh, see that these two uh, our mirror, our two pieces of a mirror. And so the mirror will then pop up here and uh, the mirror will have in it, you know, sort of how it's being used, uh, you know, what, which one is the priority disc and all that sort of thing. So that will have been set up when the, 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 the mirror was constructed. Uh, and we, it will simply know that by reading the label. And then of course that will make, appear to make a disc and so, uh, then we can slap another label on that and get all of our uh, partitions up here. Uh, and now these are ready for use uh, by the file system. And it just thinks it's just talking to a disk. It has no idea that mirroring is happening. It just is being done for it under the covers. All right, so that's pretty much how this, sort of the whole geom layer business works. A little bit more on the, the operation of GOMs. Um, when this was first done, uh, it was being put in before we had multiprocessing on the, in, in FreeBSD. It was coming in sort of late four and it actually sort of fell over. It didn't get sort of fully operational to five and five of course was the first one that had multiprocessing, but large parts of the kernel still had not yet been made multiprocessor safe. And so one of the problems that you would have is that 
uh, two different processes could both be, for example, interacting on a disk and then you could get collisions. And so if the, the code all the way down through all of the disk driver uh, was not multiprocessor safe, then you could end up having trouble. And so in order to serialize things, uh, the way that GEM no normally operates by default is that all the downward requests get handed by a G down thread. So if you've ever looked and done a PS and saw a G up and G down, uh, essentially you go into the top of it and you you hand your, your bio request into a queue for G down and G down pulls them off one at a time and passes them down. And when the interrupt comes in, all of those are aggregated and put in a queue and G up will move them back up to. So all of the, the mirror, all of the geom structures don't need to be multiprocessor safe. Well, the problem, and, and then the rule is that uh, anyone using it, you, you know, any of the modules can't sleep because that would stop all IO and they're not supposed to compute excessively. So if you're doing you know, encryption or something, uh, then you shouldn't be doing that in a G up or G down thread. Uh, so in order to sort of move forward into the multiprocessing world, we added this thing called direct dispatch. And so if everything in your stack below you is able to uh, be is, is MP safe, then you mark that module saying, okay, I'm, I'm safe for direct dispatch. And then when it comes in, you don't have to queue with G up or G down. Your thread just continues on down through the stack. And similarly, when the interrupt comes on, it just goes ripping all the way up the other way. And pretty much today, everything is direct dispatch. Um, but if you've ever seen G up and G down and wondered what they were, that's what it is. Okay, now what can happen is that one of those providers can go away. Uh, you know, a disk can die. And if a disk dies, then it gets unhooked and um, essentially a message works its way up the stack and everything else there uh, fails away and ultimately uh, the error uh, gets propagated up to the file system or the client, whoever it is that's using that particular path. Uh, the other thing is that uh, when, when a provider changes this so-called spoiling, uh, that change gets propagated up the stack. And it's this mechanism, which is what lets the tasting happen. Uh, so, you know, a new thing arrives, you, this, whatever it's underneath gets the message coming up. And that's where we go in and figure out, oh, this has a disk label on it or a mirror associated with it or whatever. Okay, so this is just sort of the, the basic underlying structure that we have to, to operate with geom modules. So when you're building a geom, you need to, for example, say, all right, is it a MP safe? In which case you may have to make sure that you mark that it can do direct dispatch. And uh, you need to be have handlers that are gonna deal with the errors coming up from below uh, and messages uh, going back and forth. All right. One of the other pieces that I'm going to need in order to sort of get to the point of being able to talk about G-Union is memory disks. Uh, and this is another fun piece of functionality that's uh, in the system. And uh, it's essentially a way of making a disk that's not really a disk, but looks like a disk uh, for other clients. And it's created and controlled with a thing called the uh, utility called mdconfig in section eight. And there's three types of uh, memory disks. Uh, one with dedicated kernel memory, one with virtual kernel memory, and one that's backed by a file system. And the next slide, I'm gonna go through that in more detail. Uh, but once one of these memory disks is created, uh, it, it will show up initially as dev md zero or whatever. Uh, it appears to GEOM consumers just like a traditional disk and everything that we've seen about how it can be used uh, is would be just the same as if it was DA0 or, or some other disk. So let me just uh, talk a little bit about what the different types of memory-based disks are. Uh, the first one is the kernel actual memory. And there's certain tests that you wanna do where you know, this is supposed to be a memory disk. I want it to be a memory disk. I want it to be in dedicated memory, not like page faulting memory or any of this other thing, real actual memory. And, and that's in malloc mode. And in this case, 
you know, if you ask for a, you know, one megabyte or 100 megabyte disk, it will malloc 100 megabytes of kernel memory. And uh, that's what will be your backing store. Obviously, you're going to be limited by the amount of memory that the kernel is willing to give you uh, for such a disk. And uh, it says it's limited to the memory available in a single kernel malloc because it's going to do a malloc. And so whatever the biggest malloc is that the kernel will allow you, that's the biggest that disk is going to be. Not going to like step through and, and do a bunch of mallocs. Okay, so this, that's for people that are being doing some pedantic test. What most people do is one of these second two. Uh, swap mode, and that just says uh, the, the disk is going to be held in the buffer cache, and the buffer cache is just part of the page pool uh, and goes for contention against all the other things that various user processes are trying to do. Uh, if it, you know, if it'll all fit in memory, then it's in memory. But if it gets, you know, pages, if the memory gets under enough demand or you put enough garbage into it, uh, then the pages get pushed out to the swap area uh, that are, you know, you're not of parts of the disk you're not using. So uh, it would be rather like having it in a user level uh, virtual memory segment. And then, and this, of course, neither of these are persistent. When that disk goes away, the memory is freed and that's it. No content is left. Sometimes you have a memory disk, but you want to actually have it persist. Um, you know, you use it for a while and then you don't need it, but then, oh, well, I want that disk back. Uh, in that case, you use vnode mode and you just give it a regular file and that's what's used for the backing store. So you just say memory disk, it's, it's more or less like you map that, that file into memory, except that that memory is being treated like a disk. So the pages get pushed to the backing file when it's under memory pressure. Uh, and before you throw away the, the, the disk, uh, all the dirty pages get pushed. So the file will cleanly reflect what that disk looked like at the time that you made it go away. And you can get it back by simply recreating it with the same file. Note that uh, this is not guaranteed if the it goes away because the system crashes. Uh, it has to go away cleanly with a, a malloc or an MD config uh, destroy. Okay, so for swap and Vino, the space by, used by the memory disk is based on the amount of data that you write to it. It does not, when you first create it, you know, write it all uh, full of zeros. It just allocates the space there. And only as you use it, uh, the, the, those things get written. And I mean, if you're using it for a file system, the file system, of course, will make sure that things are zeroed um, before it, it puts stuff on the disk. It'll never use the random contents of the disk. So there's no, it's not like it says, oh, you're about to use that. I need to make sure that part is zero. Uh, it, it simply, you know, writes to it when it's asked to write to it. All right. So, I think we're finally getting to the point where we can get to the point of this lecture, which is G union. Okay, so the G union mod GM module is uh, prax changes to a read only disk on a writable disk. So uh, the idea here, well, I originally built this because I was, I, I kept getting these bugs about FSCK and it would, uh, core dump on certain disk images. And so you'd run FSCK and it would core dump and then the disk image would be partially modified by FSCK. And so then I had to recopy the entire disk image before I could run the next thing of FSCK. And I wanted to just say, look, just throw away whatever FSCK did and I just want to try again. That was the purpose of this. Okay, so what happens is that logically we put a writable disk on top of a read-only disk. So we've got the sort of our original disk at the bottom and it's mounted read only. And then on top of that, we, we put another disk which is writable and then write requests, any write requests that come down are intercepted and they just get stored in the, the writable disk on top. And any read requests, we first check to see if they're in the top layer and if they are, we give it to you from the top layer. And if not, we just read it through from the bottom layer. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's a pretty straightforward thing to do here. You can see how the picture looks. Here we have our, our disk DA0 with its GPT labels as usual. And now we've created a, a, an MD0 disk here. 
Uh, and this is probably just going to be a swap based one because I don't really care about the contents that much. Uh, I slap a label on it so that I can make uh, MD0 slice one equal to DA0 slice one in size. And then this is the union module. And so the, this is going to be the, the bottom read only disk. And this one is going to be the top writable disk. And what it will end up creating, you can tell it if, whatever name you want, but if you don't tell it a name, it'll be the name of the top disk dash the name of the bottom disk dot union. Uh, and so uh, essentially when you create the, this, the G union, this name will appear uh, reflecting whatever the two names are that you constructed it from. Okay, and now this just looks like a regular old disk. Uh, so if you were going to FSCK that, as far as FSCK can tell, this is just that. Uh, except that when it starts writing, you know, things are getting put over here. So it, you know, it sees it, when it thinks it's writing to there, um, it, you know, it looks like it's written to there if it reads it back. But in fact, anything it's writing is going over here. Okay, so now we've got this this G union thing, and uh, give you just the sort of what needs to be done to uh, create them. It's a pretty simple geom layer, really. Uh, we have create, and that's the thing that sets up the union provider. Uh, and when it, it, it succeeds, as, as you saw, it creates the, the uh, entry and dev of that name. Uh, and then there's the destroy command, and that just takes it apart. The two commands that are the ones that are of interest one is the revert command, and that says, you know, it, FSAK screwed up, I want to try again, throw away all the changes that it made. So you just say revert, and it discards all the changes made in the top layer, reverting you to the previous state. And this operation happens, it appears to happen instantly, because all it has to do is erase a bit map, which is one bit per block in the, in the disk. And that bit just says it's, it contains useful data or it doesn't. So just boop, zero out a, a, an array of bits and boom, you're back to the previous disk. As compared to the 35 minutes that it takes to copy a two terabyte disk image back across. On the other hand, it might have actually worked and you're like, woohoo, it worked. Then you can do commit and that just goes through and takes all the blocks that are written in the top layer and writes them through to the underlying media. And voila, you now have your cleaned up disk. So, uh, you know, as a tool for testing FSCK is exactly what the doctor ordered. But it also turns out that there are, in fact, some other useful things you can do with this layer. Otherwise, why would you be here? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I do have one more thing to talk about in its actual operation. Um, the metadata exists only for the period of time that the union is instantiated. So uh, that top layer disk, it's there, plus there's a, a bit array which says which of the blocks are in use. So once you destroy the union, you've lost whatever you wrote on the top. So if it's something you want to keep, you need to make sure that you commit it before you pull the thing apart. Now, if the top disk has 4K sectors and you make it about a half a percent larger than the disk that it covers, it would be possible to store the bitmap in that extra space. And then you could actually recreate the G union. You know, if the underlying thing was, was a V node, so you know, it was being stored in a file, uh, then you could recreate the thing. Now, I haven't actually done the business to copy the bitmap out there, but that's sort of a 10 line project to do something like that. Okay. Finally, what do we? What other things can we do with this? Um, no, no, I'm not. Still haven't gotten to that slide. Still talking about how you use the silly thing. Okay. Um, so, the uh, in order to create one of these things, um, we do uh, G union create minus V just says you know give me a little extra information about it when you do it. And in this case, MD0 and DA0 P1. Uh, and then you just mount that thing on mount. You make the changes. If they're successful, you have to unmount it. You cannot do the commit or revert while it's mounted. Uh, then you can commit it. Or if they're unsuccessful, you can revert it. 
And when you're done with it, you can eliminate it, you just unmount it and destroy it. And as I've already said about three times, uh, any, once, you've, once you've pulled it apart, uh, that's it. You can't put it back together again. Okay, finally, what can you do with this thing? Um, the, so first and foremost reason that I did it is because you have some disk and you try and run FSCK and it says, okay, you need to run FSCK manually. And yes, you can run FSCK manually and you can go through and can answer each and every question, make sure you get it exactly right. And if you have things like duplicate blocks, that's kind of what you need to do. But a lot of the time, the first thing you want to do is just say FSCK minus Y. I mean, FSCK minus Y, I almost didn't put in there because I said, oh, that terrible things could happen because, you know, if you just say yes to everything, that's not always the right answer. But, uh, you know, and so I've had people run FSCK minus Y and said, it screwed up my disk. Now what do I do? And I said, well, I hope you saved the copy of the disk. <laughs> um, so in this particular case, if you have a file system and you decide you want to run FSCK minus Y, I highly recommend that you put on one of these uh, G unions because then you can run FSCK minus Y with you know, no concerns in the world because hopefully it'll work and then you'll just say commit or maybe it won't work and you'll go, oh. But at least then you can just say revert and, and you've got the copy of your disk back. <laughs> Uh, and you, you know, you can try various and sundry other things uh, to to get the thing sorted out. Okay, so uh, even though you may not be trying to debug FSCK, you may be just trying to get a bug report from me. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, if you have a disk and you're going to run FSCK minus Y, I highly recommend doing this because FSCK minus Y works surprisingly often, but when it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. And you are really often in a very bad place at that point. Uh, there was one that I had and it sort of uh, recovered everything except the root of the file system. <laughs> okay. Um, so another thing that I have actually found useful is using the GUnion utility to try out an upgrade. I mean, I know that, you know, upgrade your system from 13.1 to 13.2 is all automated and it works flawlessly every time. But, uh, you know, there's some usually some silly little thing that I've done that it, it gets caught up on. And again, this thing can just kind of cascade out of control. And so I, and now, I, I put a G union on there and then, you know, I just run the upgrade. I say, you know, just do it, do it all automatically, do whatever the defaults are, you know, let's see what happens. And surprisingly, occasionally it works. Um, but other times things don't work, but I can sort of see, oh, well, I need to go fix this, this and that, and then it will probably work. So I just revert it and try, you know, go fix those few things and then try the upgrade again. And finally, you know, everything goes through. It looks like it's all worked. Great, and then, then I'll commit it. Uh, and uh, so again, it's a tool that lets you do things that you other, you know, will probably work, but if they don't work, you don't end up in a bad place. So it's not just developers of FSCK that can make use of this tool. All right. Um, this is somewhat unrelated, but it's also, uh, sort of a, a cool thing. And so I just figured, you know, every now and then I have this opportunity to have an audience in front of me so I can say, this is a cool thing that you should know about. <laughs> uh, there's the GEOM no-op module. Uh, I assume that people understand that no-op stands for no operation. <laughs> and it was originally written as a prototype boilerplate that you needed when you wanted to write a GEOM module. I mean, there's just a certain amount of stuff that you need, uh, you know, certain header files you need and certain functions that you need and certain structures that you need, and it's all just there. So you just grab the no-op module and then, you know, start filling in whatever functionality you need. That's how I started with uh, GeoUnion, and that's when I discovered that no-op module is anything but a no-op module these days. <laughs> uh, some features began being added to the no-op module. In fact, what should really happen, the, the, the no-op module was 
the first one that was ever written by Paul Henning Camp. And it has a whole bunch of stuff that's like completely out of date with how you ought to be doing things. So I'm tempted to, to call that something else and create a new no-op module, but that's done in the style of today, which would actually be far more useful uh, for getting the boilerplate. Because I spent a great deal of time debugging the boilerplate by looking at other ones and said, well, they don't do it that way. What's that? Oh, oh, that's a completely new function that wasn't even described in no-op. All right, but let's talk about no-op because it actually has some very cool things that you might find useful. Um, in theory, all it's supposed to do is whatever comes into the top of it will be passed unchanged out the bottom of it, okay? And if you don't set any of these other things, that is in fact what it will do. Um, but it's particularly useful because you, it allows you to forcibly destroy uh, a, a you can forcibly destroy one of these modules. You can just have it go away. Uh, it's a, you can, and you can say, and what error should you return? Uh, so when a disk dies, uh, you suddenly start getting uh, ENXIO, I believe. And uh, so what happens, of course, the, the whole geom layer is set up so that when things happen, like a disk dies, it can just unplug itself, and then that gets propagated back up. And so in the NOAP module, you just put the NOAP module between your file system and, and the real disk, and you want to simulate the disk dying instead of unplugging the disk, which can be bad for the disk. Um, you simply forcibly pull out the, the NOAP module, and then the, the disk died gets passed up to the file system. Uh, and it turns out that the file system didn't deal particularly well with that. Uh, it generally would panic and reboot the system, and then it would, you know, Da da da, um, but it doesn't. It doesn't do that anymore because uh, uh, Netflix paid me a significant amount of money to make it such that when a disk dies, it simply gets for, the file system gets forcibly unmounted and the system continues running, um, which it will now do today. Uh, and that's how I was able to test a lot of that. All right. Anyway, uh, but other things you can do is put a variable delay in, in either the reading or the writing layer. Uh, and this will cause I.O. to happen out of order. And there's a whole lot of things that in theory deal with out of order, but in practice don't do all that well. Uh, so if you're doing like database testing, uh, that's a really interesting way of uh, seeing whether it, your out of order stuff is working. Another one is you can specify a probability of either a read or write failing. You know, you can just say, you know, oh, you know, one out of 10, should fail. Uh, or it, you know, if you want to really kind of push the limit, set it to be like one out of a thousand reads or write should fail. Uh, because it's sometimes those just really very infrequent but uh, you know hard hitting things that that will cause a lot of programs to not deal well with getting an EIO when they do a read or a write. Okay, so it can be useful when you're testing error recovery code. Uh, the delay handling code, uh, correctness of out of order IO. So it's actually, a, again, it's a module and you can just drop it into your stack. You know, you can put it, uh, you know, above your mirror, you can put it on one leg of the mirror. Uh, you can, you know, have one of your, you can make one of your RAID disks fail and see whether the RAID recovery is working properly. So there's all kinds of different places that uh, it can be a useful layer. And if, by the way, you are actually interested in writing a GEOM module, um, it's the place to start until, of course, it gets rewritten to something that's a better place to start. Mm -hmm. But it'll still be called NOAP. This will just be called something else. Okay. So with that, I have a few minutes for questions. We have several questions, so correct me in between them. <laughs> Uh, are G unions stackable? Yes, G unions are stackable. They're they're like any other GEOM module; they can be mixed and matched. The upgrade scenario that you talked about. How do you preserve union through its reboot at the end? Of the uh, you, it doesn't. At this point, you can't reboot it. It's just. You, you've completed, you know, you've, you've managed to get the script working and you now believe that it will reboot. Um, if you actually want to be able to do that, I suggest you use ZFS and uh, some snapshots because though they are preserved across reboots. Well, that was the third let, let me. Oh. 
want to give a, a third example, which is the first thing I thought of for G Union. Um, there are a lot of times when you want to use a read only the root file system, um, whether you're booting from a, a DVD or over the network or depenguinating a system and booting from a memory file system. Um, and then having a G union on top of that, so you can just treat it like a regular file system and read, write, manage it like you would anything else would make it, you have to do a lot less hoop jumping to make it usable when you log into a read only file system. So just a plug for that. And then I, I would highly suggest getting a uh, conservable version of JUnion uh, on the books if you are planning to do that already. Uh, I hadn't planned to do it already, but it's sort of at that level that it's such a trivial, I yeah, trivial. It's a mere matter of coding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you know, it, if it seems like it would be a useful thing to do, it, it would not be difficult to do. The biggest thing is that uh, sort of it, the easiest thing to do is have a, 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 a disk that's exactly the same size as the one you're trying to cover. And so, you know, we'd, we'd have to put something to let people know how much bigger it needed to be. Sure. That's really the only thing that stopped me from doing it initially. Question here? Yes. So, uh, you don't throw the, uh, preserving the bitmap. Uh, why do you have to use uh, memory disk or any other disk? Why not to just allocate memory from the Vion class? So basically, you just put union on the disk, and whenever you have a write, you allocate, allocate a block in memory. You don't have to really store it anywhere, right? Because you don't preserve it anyway. Right. Yeah, it could have been done that way. Um, it was just easier to let something else deal with the memory allocation, which is the MD driver. And then, I mean, all I, all, all the stuff having to do with memory, I don't have to think about it. It's just there, um, you know, and, and it's, it's at, you know, the MD driver is allocating the memory as necessary if we're using swap. And so all I then have to do is just keep track of what, where it's written. So it's really just, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel when it was already there. And what <laughs> so there was an idea, I don't think it was ever implemented, but uh, currently you only can put new genome layer on top of existing one, right? So you can put partition on a disk, mirror on partition, and union on top of it. It's not possible to insert something in between. Right? And it would be useful, uh, especially for genome class like union, able to insert geom union into layers. So for example, I have ZFS pool yep. on one disk and I would like to experiment. So now we have actually a zipool checkpoint, but before the zipool checkpoint, it would be nice to be able to like insert G union mm -hmm. between disk and ZFS and do some experiments and I can revert or commit if everything works, right? So it's like a checkpoint. For this to work, we need to be able to like inject. Yes. It, in theory, it would not be that difficult to do that. For example, you should be able to insert the no op sort of arbitrarily in the hierarchy. Um, the mechanics of doing that don't really exist. You, you sort of have to be able to suspend things long enough to, you know, make the connections and then unsuspend them. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't trivial, that's why it wasn't done, but uh, it would be especially useful in this case. Yes, now, the, I, there are times when I've had it and it's like, geez, I want to put a geom in there. And it's like, oh, I can't do that. But yeah, it, it, it's, I looked at it and it's like, oh, how hard can it be? And the answer was, it's hard. It's a non-trivial project. Maybe we'll get some poor Google Summer of Code student to do that. <laughs> they won't know how hard it is. Yeah. Uh, you, you've been hiding your hand up for a while. Yeah, so I'm curious. At the moment, this is uh, targeted towards memory disks. It's supposed to point, basically turn it into almost the lazy mirroring, where you have one disk that's got your um, original file system and then another actual physical disk that you're pointing, that you uh, legally put the deltas on. 
Uh, yes, I mean, if I simply save that the bitmap, that's what you've got. Right, but because you can simply, you know, put it. You can take it apart when at, at your when the system is shut down, and you put it together as part of bringing it back up. But this doesn't have to be an, an MD. Uh... No, it doesn't. Okay. Or I mean, you know, you could have. I, I would probably use MD, but with a file backing it. Yeah. And so then everything's going to just be stored in that file. Yeah. You know, again, I'm lazy. Let the file system deal with that. I don't want to. Sure. File systems are hard. Don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> An absolutely stupid performance question. And it's this. Um, you were talking about G up and G down. Yeah. Having those running two threads. And I'm thinking, okay, that uh, that's wonderful because there's very few locks and it guarantees ordering in amongst the G on modules. And you see this point, but when you have the direct I.O., which now the BSDs use, uh, doesn't the addition of the additional locks cause you performance problems in the GM layer, or how was that sidestepped? Um, the, there are more locks, as you know, that's just always an issue. Uh, but the real thing is that the latency of disks, even flash drives, uh, is sufficiently higher than the, the lock overhead that the lock overhead kind of disappears. Um, and the, the difference between G up and G down, where you have to do a complete context switch, you know, there's a context switch into G down, and then there's another context switch between G up and getting back up. So you get, you're adding two context switches on a single thread. I mean, that that is like the definition of a global lock yeah. in spade. So uh, the improvement for the direct was, dramatic and the, by contrast, the locking due to the speed at which things are going uh, is is not too bad. Good. Yeah, you, I, I mean, you do see it just, I mean, you get hot locks in that path sometimes. Thank you. Yep. Any more? Yes. So I guess this is sort of related to the lazy mirror question. Um, might it be possible to commit um, a mounted file system? I realized that it would uh, result in a, a, a dirty lower file system. But um, but if you could do that, then you could, for example, do your upgrade on a live system and uh, and still be able to check your results and trust that you know you can sync and then do a, do a fairly safe FSCK uh, on your next reboot. But that would that would allow you to to um, basically implement mirror without without unmounting. Yes, that that would be another way of doing it. Um, but you know, the thing is we, we already have a tool, which is perfect for this, which is mm -hmm. CFS and, uh, you know, snapshots and you know, all those things. And, you know, you just take the thing that's a snapshot and then you make the changes to it. And then you say, okay, now that's the real one. I mean, just all that mechanism is in there. And so, uh, they, I still use UFS for free buys. Yeah. Well, for some reason I do too, but <laughs> okay. Any more? Oh, yes. Um, for Apple's use case, it occurs to me that there's something simpler than changing the geom to be able to insert arbitrary layers. You could have a mode switch in GUnion to allow it to have a pass-through mode and then turn it on to start going to the upper layer and then a version of commit that's commit and switch back to pass-through. And then you could do what he wanted without having to change the stack. Yep. But you would have to create GUnion every time, right? Remember about You wanted to be able to use it, yeah. Also, um, Genome. Um, Genome could use this as well. Like, uh, the open types, when you're already in the middle of something and you just want to. But it, but it might also be a good step to supporting the change in geometries with, with Geom later, because if you put it in pass through mode, it's a no op to insert it in the layer and then turning it on is a separate step. Right. So it might make the, the changes to geom simpler. You could you could make a module which is essentially a no op module that can clone itself. And then you know, it clone, you know, it clones a second copy of itself and then you it replaces itself with something else. Um, but you know the almost point is that it you know it's more friction. You know, and and having that extra friction there, you know, there's people that are busily trying to shave, you know, microseconds off here and there. And oh, by the way, we just added, you know, half a millisecond. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, would you mind elaborating on the? Would you mind elaborating on uh, 
Okay, the business with running FS check faster is uh, there's a, a minus Y option to FSCK, and that just says whatever it at, you know, whenever you ask a question, just answer it yes. And so you just say minus Y, and it's, you know, it's gazillions of things go flying across the screen that you don't see. And then it finally comes to the end and either says, your file system is clean, and you smile, or it says, your file system is hosed. You need to run FSCK again. And like, uh, and it's it's this, the case where it doesn't come out clean that you then can just clear it and then you can go through and answer the questions one at a time uh, or you know take some other approach. Back up. <laughs> Maybe it was uh, it would be a good idea to always put GeoV Union when you run FS, FS check my dash Y. Yeah, I, you know, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I should put that in the man page. <laughs> of course, who reads the man page? Right? <laughs> I, 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 I've got it. No, when you run FSCK minus Y, the first question, which will not be answered yes, is do you want a geom union <laughs> inserted before this is run? Why ask? <laughs> Just do it. Yeah, Just do it, yeah. Okay, I think we are past time. So enjoy your break. Thank you. <laughs>